Hey guys, uh, welcome back to what I believe is the eighth episode of uh, the VFX Nomad podcast. And as you can tell from the Christmas tree behind Josh Parks, uh, it is, uh, what is it, a, a week or so away from Christmas? So that's when we're recording this. And um, we don't have too much uh, planned, but we were kind of just roughly talking about uh, Godzilla Minus uh, One, a movie that just came out by, I have to look up uh, the name again. Takashi. Takashi. Yamazaki. Yamazaki, thank you. Uh, and I guess the story behind this movie was that um, he wrote and direct and got the rights to use a, the Godzilla rights and he made his own film and he started his own VFX company. The film apparently cost around $15 million to make. Uh, it's a Japanese film and it's kind of blown up. It's, it's, almost, uh, it's almost surpassed the creator from uh, Gareth Edwards, and which, which is another, I think it was an $80 million budget or so. It was, it was under a million, uh, 100 million. And uh, I guess I want to throw out to the room, like, um, first, have you seen the film? Have you heard about reactions in the VFX uh, of the film, a and what do you think of films with these, uh, this this tiny budget that are blowing up and uh, you know making um, far more international grossing uh, revenue than these I don't know blockbusters that are two hundred million? I think that it's cool that that happened. I think it's a little bit dangerous too, if um, the expectation becomes lower budget because. I've worked on quite a few lower budget things and the demands are pretty crazy. Um, the last Japanese film I had worked on was quite, uh, the bids were quite low and it ended up being one of the worst projects I had ever touched. So, I, I mean, that's I the thing, right? Like, if the budget is like crazy low, maybe the VFX company just like eats the loss if that makes sense or something so but tiny do you reckon they use the budget like wisely were there just a few like really awesome vfx shots was it well here's the thing um i would say that the film certainly has really good vfx in certain areas and i, I would probably say poor vfx in other areas you can tell that they use the budget wisely <laughs> i would say that but i mean going out of the film it had as much destruction as you could want from like a monster film in some really really cool uh sequences of like uh godzilla like spitting out a nuke or something like you know like this huge explosions and and destruction stuff and when i came out and i looked up the budget and i learned it was 15 million i was like that's almost that's nothing like 15 million that's, uh, that's i like think i've never heard in about. la so that's crazy <laughs> man. did you by any chance watch the credits i did yeah but it was all in japanese except for a few english words Okay, so if there were like, let's say, if there were other VFX houses that were, would they, did you see any? Because then they'd be no. listed in English. Or no, uh, I saw, um, I guess, what was the name of the studio? Give me one second. The name of the studio that, uh, I might have gotten this wrong, but apparently he created is Sh Shirogumi uh, Studio, handled by Shirogumi at its studio Chofu. I think it was Chofu Studios. And uh, I guess he created it, or maybe he had created it, and that was one of their first films okay. or so. Um, the, but the no, I don't I think so. That, okay. The reason I ask that is because a lot of times, like, if there is, like, a pocket for, for high-end or for, like, epic hero shots, sometimes they'll outsource them to, like, mm -hmm. somebody like uh, ILM or something. And at Megalist, this is what we used to do mm -hmm. back in the day, is, like, we'd pick, like, like six to 12 like big hero shots and just be responsible for that chunk. Mm. For yeah, that makes sense. Because that's the it... stuff that's going to win you the work, I guess, on the next one. I mean, something that's very interesting, because I know, Tony, you mentioned like Gareth Edwards as well, right, with the crater, and that was kind of a lower budget thing. Yes. Maybe what you're going to start seeing, and he's also an ex VFX artist. Like, yeah, correct. Mentioned this director's an ex VFX artist. So mm -hmm. maybe if it does start turning towards slightly lower budget stuff where there's less risk, then maybe there's a strength in picking directors who've got VFX experience because they know where to use the budget, if that makes sense. Yeah, or at least leaning heavily on people that can save the money. Look, I think I think with the two films, The Creator and The Godzilla Minus One, uh, the thing that's very obvious is that they knew what they were doing going in. They had everything storyboarded. Like, they shot 
the the sequences or the shots per, in a prepared way where the VFX would be not an afterthought, but it would be very, very thought out beforehand. And I think that's why the budget is able to be so low. Because if you know exactly that you're the one in control and there's not going to be like some sort of screening where then you're going to change the plot and then you're going to change the design of the monster or something. I guess that's why... Uh, I think it's the iterations. I think a lot of films today have a lot of iterations and a lot of work is being scrapped and done again, which is is inflating the, the budget. Yeah, but yeah, but you can do that because it's low budget, right? So like, for instance, if you spend 500 million on a film, you have to keep testing that thing because it has to be a success. So you've got, whereas if with 10, 15 million, there's way less risk. So maybe you don't test as much because if it's a flop, then you've got another 10 in the back. I mean, it's the same, this is uh, Adrian by life. It's the same as investing, right? A diversified portfolio. If you've got 500 million, you can now make 20 or 30 films. <laughs> and then one of those has got to hit as opposed to like everything just resting on this one uh, thing. I, I would agree with you, but I think this year has changed that um, model. Because if, if we look at the most successful film this year, it was Oppenheimer, Barbie. Uh, I don't know if you want to put the creator in that, but certainly it was, it was successful, successful in the sense that it was a small budget and got its money back. Uh, but I think the, the age of like, oh, this is in the bank for sure. This is going to be a hit. I think we're beyond that now because I think it's uh, as risky to pour money into a $300 million film than it is to uh, take, a, take a bigger risk on a, I don't know, a more edgy film perhaps. Yeah, just ask Disney. <laughs> yeah, look at Marvels, man. I mean, it's <laughs> but but the thing is as well, like it's all it's probably going to be data driven, right? It's like Netflix knows the data of what people watch and what works well and all this kind of stuff. So it's not like they're guessing uh, that is thirty. Like they're still an estimated guess, but at some point there is a bit of luck involved and things like this. So yeah, it's cool. I mean, how do you guys feel about it? Because I guess maybe you'll start to see this play into the more the no CGI stuff. Now, Godzilla is obviously a CGI film, but mm. if you are getting more of these kind of lower budget VFX projects then maybe there's going to be more narrative going in the direction of there's no cgi in this thing even though there will be yeah i think there's like a lot of inertia in, in those things especially in the higher budgets thing is if you were so, so much money into something uh you gotta make sure that it's going to work and the moment you have a formula even if it's not the perfect formula and it's uh making a profit in every single film it has just so much inertia to keep going in that direction for for years and probably for more years than uh, the audience would even want to and i guess that's also a reason why while that's still going on there's like this other ways of working that are starting to get more traction now and such as those films uh, we're talking about and i guess it's uh yeah they're probably not excluding each other right yeah it's gonna be interesting to see this guy's career though like see if he stays on those kind of like lower budget things or if he gets given a 300 million budget because generally you find that uh you can kind of tell that they don't really know what to do with the rest of the budget and they kind of doesn't make as much an improvement as you kind of want. So it's going to, yeah, it'd be interesting to see. Uh, speaking a bit about the the whole no CGI thing, uh, I'm sure you guys have probably watched the video from uh, Jonas Ut Using, uh, the no CGI. He did one on basically on Top Gun and then he covered the second one on, uh, um, what was it? It wasn't Oppenheimer, was it? No, it was Napoleon. So, did you guys watch the video? Did you yeah. haven't seen it, Adrian? Do you have any thoughts? I watched them. I, I think they are great. Um, he's doing like such a good job on documenting this stuff, right? I mean, yeah. I'm kind of in two minds about this. Uh, partly because <clears throat> I was thinking about like other industries where there's maybe people who don't get recognized, and it's kind of part of their job. So, a friend of mine is in publishing. He works with Penguin Books. And he was like, a lot of the top authors don't write their books, right? It's someone else, like ghostwriters. And it's probably the same with songs as well. Like your favorite song maybe wasn't even written by the per person that sings it. And that's kind of accepted in those fields. So like, I, I wonder how those people feel like in those fields. It's kind of given that they won't be recognized. So I guess, is should we be re Like, I'm not saying, I think, yes, we should be recognized. But what I mean is like, is it in our contract to not be recognized, if that makes sense? Like, so for instance, like the ghostwriter, they know that, hey, look, you're not going to get credit for any of this. And maybe there's conditions who you can turn and things like that. So do you think it could maybe go like that in the future where you have VFX companies not allowed to say? I mean, that had, does happen a little bit. But I was just trying to think of other industries where this happens and how people kind of deal with it and feel about it. Maybe we stop calling ourselves visual effects artists and more like ghost movie makers. 
Well, I like Dice Movie Maker. <laughs> <laughs> goes to the effects oh no that already exists the company. <laughs> but, but <do> <laughs> they've been doing I mean? all the effects but do you see what i mean it's kind of like it, are those people super annoyed like because everyone knows that that happens right so like when you read a book you know that there's ghost writers you don't know to the to the extent so is that part of it or do you think it should go I, the other way where the arsteries i have the feeling that in some way this is a, a reaction as well to what we were mentioning before uh there's the fact that the let's put as much money as possible into a huge formula uh, certified film that is just transformers killing zombies and whatever uh, and that got so far uh, like it kept going because of the inertia and uh, so that kind of cost in some way probably uh, lots of people to pursue like we are just doing the opposite thing which is what the world needs and and that in some way is also not uh yeah not balanced and and that just causes to suppress something that I, I mean vfx just for normal people in a regular situation would not be something that you would want to hide it would be like we've been smart we've done this so that we make the magic in some way and the magic is not just vfx it's every every single part working together so yeah i have the feeling that's a big part of it like how we are now like repelled by that formula I'll I'll do a pushback a little bit on what I I know Josh is asking is asking if there's this is related in other in other industries but one of the things that I think was a huge loss was when we lost uh Blu-rays and DVDs where all the behind the scenes um were shot I don't know like a film comes out on Netflix like Stranger Things for example I'm not I'm not sure where you would go except for maybe YouTube to find behind the scenes or the company breakdown I guess you'd have to go to the company website. But I remember like when I was a kid, I was watching all these movies like The Matrix and so and watching all the behind the scenes and seeing the camera set up for the bullet time and the and the green screens and that really wanted me make me get into visual effects. And if the more you hide it, I mean, that can't really be good for any industry to hide uh, a particular profession. But they must have the data, right? Like the marketing people must know, otherwise they wouldn't be pushing this narrative. So they, they it must sell more tickets if people feel like wow that like Tom Cruise you go see Mission Impossible because he actually jumped out of that thing or whatever yeah. right so like there must be a there's there's a it makes money basically and that's why they're going towards that narrative right yeah it's uh, yeah what it's do you part of it, I guess what do you think G what do you think about this whole discussion and where it's going um to be honest I'm not super in the like in whatever my algorithm or feed is the this notion of like not no VFX happening is kind of eluding me. Um, that being said, I mean, we, we don't, if you're a ghostwriter, you are a ghostwriter and you, it's defined by the name, you know, that you're not getting credit. If you're a VFX artist, I mean, we're kind of called, at least in compositing, we're kind of called the invisible art. So we don't really, you know, we, we watch the credits. We know we're going to be at the end. We know that the caterers are going to be, be ahead of us maybe i'm just jaded and i've just gotten used to not being i guess glorified but it doesn't affect me so much but mm. does it annoy you if like like for instance i bet on megalith if you were comp souping a show and you had a real relationship with the director and then you see the director saying oh yeah we did all that in camera i think that would get you a bit right so like i think i agree that as an artist, if you've been doing this for a while, it's kind of, well, as long as I get to keep doing what I enjoy and things like this. But I, I, I guess for a comp soup or something like that, it's... I that know. would annoy me, yes. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> to like hide the, the team's effort and team's work, yeah. Um, I, I've been doing a lot of reflecting on this whole um, discussion, and I think the terminology that people are using is, is not helpful. Uh, I think the general public, look, they don't have, have any idea what too much CGI or no CGI, like they don't really have a concept. What they do have a concept of is like silly CGI. Like, for example, some of the best sequences that on these films, like, um, for example, uh, Jonas pointed out that on, on Top Gun, they were attaching the camera to the jets. And so you'd see like the camera outside the jet um, facing the cockpit. And so they actually filmed the jets, but then they would add you know cg jets in the background but the plates were still there or you know it's it's seeing the nose of the plane going through the valley and then maybe they're replacing a few things like some gunfire or something i think the point is um he did this in, in his video where he shows an older video of a, like a dogfight in the air 
where two jets are fighting from the early thousands, I guess. And the camera is just doing a roller coaster. It's like like the it's like zooming into the jet and going around the jet. And like so, there, I think the difference is that people want the 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 scenes to be grounded in reality, and that usually means having a strong plate and having a strong back plate that's that's actually possibly to be filmed and not these like crazy zoom in revolve around 360 slow motion whatever uh shot so that that's my take on it is like people don't like silly vfx uh not yeah. necessarily good or bad i think we're kind of seeing a pendulum effect because before like all of this was going on cgi was getting a bit ridiculous in films especially with a lot of the like some of the superhero films that were just constantly surreal and silly and this and that and maybe that this is we're just seeing like the pendulum kind of come back but when the pendulum comes comes back it's usually accompanied by extreme statements such as oh there's no cgi in my films etc cetera, etc cetera. It, yeah it always goes back too far each way basically so yeah. and then it eventually it, gets the middle that that being said it's also the tone of the film you know like uh if you're watching a drama and then suddenly there's a crazy silly cgi scene it totally takes you out of the moment of that of that film but then it works completely if you're watching a movie like rrr i don't know if you have seen that uh that it's an amazing uh indian film where it's from the start to the end it's just totally ridiculous and bogus like the guy is fighting tigers and lions and they're, they're like on top of a bridge fighting each other and everything uh, it's like a completely completely ridiculous movie but it works because the movie is ridiculous like they break out into song and dance because you know it's an indian film it's a bollywood film or whatever and it just works because the silliness is like in the actual film right uh it, it, and it just doesn't work that much if the, if the film's theme is more i don't know grounded in reality and then suddenly something ridiculous happens yeah i guess a part is also that vfx are also used a lot in i know fast and furious uh films like just cars and there's probably the impression that now you can do anything uh, with a computer and that's just easy in some way and maybe that makes the marketing move of saying that it's done for real like for the film to be more you know tricky or more money or more difficult to create in some way but well, like we'll the, the best films are really expensive and really difficult to make and they involve vfx and lots of practical stuff just thinking like avatar like the amount of reference that they took um Ooh. yeah so a combination that's a really good uh one to throw out the avatar because yeah that i mean that's obviously it's 100 percent cg basically besides a couple characters that are uh practically filmed but you don't f you don't feel like it's CG because the camera moves are very realistic. The references, as you said, are, is it, they're trying to match things very accurately, and uh, it just works. And it, maybe that's because the whole film is again like one theme of. Well, and uh, it took like eleven years as well to make or something <laughs> that kind of helps as well. And a lot of money. Like uh, I remember I was talking to a guy in a pub about this. He was quite bitter about it because he was like. Yeah, of course Avatar won best for years because it was like took eleven years to make and it was up against <laughs> everything else that took like two years. It's uh I mean, yeah, but again, it kind of just comes down to knowing how to use it, right? Which is the same thing as we've mentioned with these directors like Gareth Edwards and the and the guy who made the Godzilla film you mentioned. Like it's just knowing how to use the tool. You're not just using the tool to market it and say, look, we use this amazing thing. It's like, no, it's like it's gotta be actually add to something. Uh, I wanna throw out a question of <laughs> How do you think some of these films get so out of hand? Do you think it's the director or is it the studio pushing for like, no, we need this like crazy money shot. That's amazing. Is it just, I don't know, poor VFX studios that are being crunched uh, to death? Like wh where does the blame lie uh, in some of this? Just if you, I don't want to like play the blame game, but I'm just wondering where it falls apart in the whole pipeline of this thing. I mean, most by out of hand, do you mean like like hours worked, or do you mean like just like visual ridiculousness? I meant I meant visual really ridiculousness. Like who, who, who shows like uh, you know the camera zooming into somebody's eyeball and then you know doing like who comes up with this and says, yeah, that's a that's a great idea. Let's do that. I mean, I very recently worked on a film that had a zombie shark in it, and that <laughs> that came straight out of a comic book. But we we like we. I feel like the the vibe of it when it was being briefed to us was that we knew it was kind of just taking the piss. Like we knew it was being ridiculous from the start. 
just one example out of I mean, mm. I think it's probably the case of just too many cooks, right? And people throwing ideas in and none of those ideas work together. Like I remember speaking to a mate of mine when Sonic was happening and like the trailer came out and everyone was obviously destroying it because he's got like some weird like kid's body and stuff. And like every, everyone was like, yeah, everyone kind of knew that it looked good and everyone knew it looked weird, but it's just, everyone's like, oh, maybe we just make his arm a bit longer to just help that. And maybe we just make his, and then by the end of it, you've got this like weird mess. And also I think another problem is the fact that I mean, it's kind of the same thing. You don't end up with one person's vision, which you almost need on a lot of these things, because most of the time in these big productions, the director's like just a puppet director. And it's actually the producers that are dictating everything. And it's kind of by council. So I think it's mostly just like, you just need one person to go, this is the idea. So you get like the purest take on that thing. Um, I mean, obviously there's a bit of collaboration, but it's just kind of finding the balance, I think. Because if you just listen to everyone, then all the ideas don't necessarily work together. Yeah, that's a great point. Like, I, that's probably part of why, like, the huge films mostly work, like, huge VFX films, thinking like Avengers and stuff like that, mostly work when they stick to a very, very uh, basic formula, like the hero, the, you know, the stereotype thing. And the more that you, you go towards something more complex story-wise, uh, the less you can afford to have so many thinking heads. And, and that's why that, that tends to go more towards, uh, you know, Arrival or the creator of like those films that are not that much of a huge budget, but at the same time, it feels like it has more control in, in less hands in some way. Right? Yeah, I think, but, but I think it's going to be crazy interesting. Like, cause if you can make a film for 15 million, you can market the whole thing yourself. You could just put it on YouTube and get people to pay to stream it. And then you bypass all the production companies. So like it starts kind of breaking the process a little bit in regards to this thing. Um, mm. I mean, it's great for that. I mean, that Godzilla film sounds like it's a great thing for the VFX community in Japan, right? Like, it's, uh, it's pre I mean, actually, gee, how, uh, how do you feel about that? Like, how is the VFX industry in Japan out of interest? Like, is it growing? Is it staying the same? Or I would say it is growing. Um, it hasn't grown as much as, like you said, South Korea. That's kind of really become the meteoric rise of Asia in VFX and filmmaking in general, Netflix, et cetera. Um, but I, in Japan, the market's definitely, definitely getting better, definitely increasing. Um, but like I said, it still kind of scares me, though, the, the effects and the potential trends that can come out of making a hugely successful $15 million film with lots of VFX in it. Because I know like, what that implies. And I, I could try to maybe ask around and see like, what people's schedules were like that actually worked on the film, but I'm willing to put my money that they might not have had the best time i mean that arcane i might just just to say that like that league of legends like arcane show whatever it was that, which looks amazing apparently that was brutal to work on but it looked like incredible right so yeah, yeah. I, I hear you on that i mean out of interest though like because obviously there's no subsidies in japan right so is it why do you think uh and same with south korea like why is it that directors who are from those parts of the world are keeping work there is it because they're trying to grow them seeing themselves or is it because it's cheaper or is it because they like going in the office and they don't want to deal with outsourcing to other countries or like, do you see what I mean? Like why, why do it? It sounds like a long way to go about getting BFX done in an expensive way. Like, do you mean like, why would a Western company no, hire no, 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 a no, no, company? No. Like, let's say Godzilla, the Godzilla from Tony was talking about, why not just outsource that to a small company where the sub, there's already tax subsidies in Canada or Australia or the UK, for instance, why set up it, set up yourself? Is it, could, do you think you would do it because it just fell into some porn or are there other advantages? Uh, I mean, like in the case of the Godzilla film, that was a Japanese production, right? So yeah. who would they outsource to? Well, you could outsource to anyone, right? Like they, we, every Marvel film is a US production, but they don't just get made in the US. Yeah, or UK films get yeah. also outsourced to places. But they wouldn't have the budget to like hire a British company or a or an American company. Ah, so you think? But but there's no subsidies mm. in Japan, right? So you reckon it's cheaper to get VFX made in Japan, even though the subsidies there in other countries. That's what happens in Spain for sure. Uh, I mean, it? there's subsidies in Spain, uh, clearly, but uh, not many projects are done with subsidies, especially the lower end projects or, or the lower budget projects. I think there might be subsidies in Korea, but there's definitely not in Japan because I've, I've heard a lot of complaints from company owners here that they don't, they don't get the tax incentives that a lot of other companies do. 
kind of feel like it's super impressive if you end up creating a successful VFX company in one of these places, though. Because it's, I mean, you're playing on hard mode, right? Like, it's, <laughs> even if your costs are the same, you're still like 20% more or 30% more. It's kind of, kind of well, e even in the in the United States, I think that's uh, one of the places where the VFX industry has been hit the most by the strikes. And uh, I mean, I know still a few people, and I think they're under pretty pretty bad conditions because they just simply don't make uh, films in, in the U.S. anymore, like hardly any. They do a lot of commercials and a lot of TV shows maybe, but hardly any films are actually done by VFX companies. They're, they're mostly in Canada now, I think. I mean, the rates there, though, like, it's, I feel like even just the rates alone without subsidies, I mean, I remember hearing about people on like $100 an hour or $80 an hour. I mean, that's substantially more than what, not substantially, but it's a fair bit more than what other people would be paid in other parts of the world. That That is true, but America is a big place and not everything needs to be done in Los Angeles. A, a good example is in Spain and the VFX is, is some of it's done in the Canary Islands and they have a they have a, a tax incentive there. And if they do the VFX in the in the Canary Islands, they they get paid, right? So shout out to Ignacio, <laughs> yes, uh, to Eero Eero Pictures. Um, the, but yeah, I mean, I, I could see that. Like, why not? I, I remember there was once, uh, I think an MPC. I, I believe it was MPC in Louisiana and and uh, Baton Rouge, <laughs> and uh, there was a studio there. I'm sure it's long gone, but uh, it, it might still be there. But but that was uh, like ten years ago or so. But I mean, you, you see some of these things. I mean, G remembers the uh, digital domain started a, a office in Florida. I mean, I I think that's come out of fashion though. I think that they've just given up, and they've sort of said, "Yeah, it's we'll we'll do it outside the U.S. now." But why would they have those studios? It's mostly just for the clients to come in, right? It's like have some like client facing part of the company, I guess. So the director can come in. Have them in LA or to have them in those offices? Have them in LA or the States in general. If you've got a, a director who's in LA, then maybe it's quite nice for them to be able to come into the office and talk to people and things. So I know that's a big part of why some studios have kept their office in London, even though they predominantly work from home, so that directors can come in from Pinewood or things like this um, to talk to people. I guess that's a good yes. point. I, I wonder if when a UK makes a film like a, like a Harry Potter or, or one of Nolan's films, uh, it, do you think part of the reason he gets some of the budget is from the UK and it's like a stipulation in there, you must make this part of this movie in the UK? Or do you think that... I think to get the subsidy, because I remember speaking to, it might be been Giacomo actually, he was saying that if they shoot at Pinewood or something, then it makes sense for them to keep a certain amount in the, in the UK because all the subsidies and how they work together. So he yeah. was like, you can kind of tell how the UK VFX industry is going based on just the, how booked up the studios are in mm. uh, are at the time. So... I mean, it's looking pretty good over here because I think they've booked up for a long time. So it's like, so that was his kind of like point. And I use that as quite a good reference to work out how busy it's looking. Kind of like, I guess there's like a 12 month fatigue from shooting to, uh, or delay to shooting to comping maybe. Mm. But I know that's what he mentioned. It's kind of like a whole package together, right? It's not just like you pick one VFX company and that's your subsidy. It's kind of spread out between the whole process along the whole thing. So yeah, I don't know. It's crazy interesting. But I just find it so interesting that like, even with all that stuff happening, directors would still keep VFX in South Korea or Japan, for instance, right? Like, there must be something there, a reason for them to do that. I think probably some films um, get a cultural um, mm. a cultural government subsidy package. Like, if, it, if you just make a random bullshit film, uh, you don't get the uh, cultural package. But uh, in, in Germany, for example, if you make a like a, a German film that is that is promoting German culture and you know doesn't show too much blood and guts or something, then then they'll give you uh, like a, a fat package uh, for for subsidies. But I'm sure maybe I mean Godzilla clearly falls under the, the realm of like cultural significance of uh, Japanese filmmaking or so. So I'm sure they I'm sure that guy um, got. Uh, some money from the government or some support at least the uk is like that that's why like big ben always gets blown up and everyone's on the london tube <laughs> and you see it for the chinese market as well right because they have to they edit it basically because only x map film uh western films can be shown in china or something a year or something so that's why they have to re-edit them to get them get them in that's such a big market so mm. uh, there's like yeah. also a part like for example in spain that's like the, the example i know the most uh, if you have like to shoot or spend three million euros for example here uh, and you spend two million euros on the on the shoot, then you can spend the the extra one million in post production. And if you do it locally, and that needs to happen locally, and you cannot outsource that part. So mm. that, that's why in many productions I'm seeing that 
whenever they are doing some shoot here, they also want to do some uh, VFX or, or post production in general, and like to get that uh, threshold. There. Do you get more percentage off like the the more Thanos gloves, Thanos Infinity Stones <laughs> use of Spain? <laughs> yeah, yeah. tax related stones, <laughs> subsidy but stones. But I've never seen so gone. Subsidy <laughs> stones. <laughs> <laughs> but but I remember speaking, it is very much like that because I remember speaking to a guy. They basically on a big production they split it between Australia, Vancouver, and London and all this stuff. So you're right. Like each stone is like one of these Catching subsidy places basically. <laughs> and there and there's people involved in maxing out the subsidies on every single place and working things out. I mean that was I think used to be a big reason why a lot of overtime would get when sh shots or shows really hit the fan. It would come back to London. To a certain extent because there's no overtime paid here whereas if you ended up doing them in canada it might cost you way more because they have to pay overtime for it so mm -hmm. it's like yeah it's very interesting seeing the decisions made based on this uh uh on that point i wanted to ask you josh i have heard that um the uh, overtime uh issue in the uk has been resolving itself slowly and that's v much more common than when i was there in 2015 that you would see uh um, artists getting compensated for longer hours. Is that is that so, or do you still think there's a long way to go? I work for ILP, and it's and which is a Swedish company, and we haven't had to do a load of overtime for a long time now. Um, I mean, one thing I'd say is it kind of depends on the project still. It's definitely got better, and companies are paying overtime now, which is amazing. Mm. But it also tells you, hey, how come they can pay overtime now and they said they couldn't pay it before, right? <laughs> so that's something as well to to think about going forwards with all sorts of negotiations and things but yeah i think it's definitely got way better since we since i started out in the industry it's got way way better i think it's also because i actually think it's the juniors who are doing the best job on this because mm. they are putting pressure on the employees and not putting up with shit basically <laughs> really like, which is pretty great yeah 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 like they i mean i remember being teaching uh teaching at university very good university in the uk and the students there wouldn't want to work for a particular company, even if they had an offer because of what they'd heard about that company. Oh, but wow. in general, juniors are getting a, a very good at a voice and their opinion of things I'm finding. So I think that's helped. I think also what's helped is the fact that there's a, a smaller senior compositor pool or senior artists in general pool. Because when I started out in the industry, NPC would hire maybe like two people a year in uh, junior compass, and then it would be all mids and seniors. So there's this weird point in the industry now where there's a lack of senior compers, which means that senior compers can be like, no, fuck this. Like, I don't want to do this, right? <laughs> and I think still, like, I, th I think still, like, I, I don't mind doing a bit of overtime if I feel like it's it's useful and, and worth it. And like, yeah, I want to make this shot look cool. But I think it's uh, it's definitely got way better. But I feel like this is kind of industry-wide as opposed to, um, yeah, just in the UK. But yeah, it's got better, like overtime paid and stuff, which is good. Slightly off subject, but same subject. Being in Sweden, is there this like this uh, culture of not doing a whole lot of work outside of what's? Yeah, they're very. I mean, you know what the most nuts thing is? Uh, them having like that. So in Sweden, a lot of the Swedes have like two months off in summer, or like a whole month off in summer, which is amazing. And they just go traveling. They go <laughs> north and just like chill out. Like, I think it is a lot of the culture there. Um, is very work life balance related. I mean, that's mm. why I love it mostly because it's uh, you get a real sense of that, and they know when to pick the battles as well. Like, that's the thing I find. Like, it's not like they're. I mean, yes, they go crazy and everything because everything's got to look good, but they know when to really like push and and stuff. So um, yeah, I think the culture is a big, big, big part of it. The Swedes' culture. So when it is required, do you find that there's like some reluctance to to engage in that? No, it's never been pressured. It's always it's always been me asking to do overtime, not vice versa. Mm, I like volunteering is, or Yeah, because it's like I I want this shot to look really good and I want this to look better. So I, I need to, to do some overtime here. Um and I actually think it's kind of funny, like it's very interesting for me to see people who are new to the show, maybe like London coordinators who are used to being like, no, like you're gonna get this shit done and all this stuff. Whereas actually I feel like um I think actually it's partly as well because ILP's got a good reputation for delivering high quality work and they've known their clients for a long time and the owners of the company still own it. Like they're still part of it. So they're dealing directly with the client and they're like, look, like, can we just have an extra week or month because we can make this look really good? 
And I think that helps. Like being this kind of like we're in this weird place of working on big productions and being a smaller company means that they can ask for this kind of stuff. I mean, I mean, speaking of that, so I was re- reading this article the other day, speaking of Swedish companies, and like there's a lot of good and successful startups that come out of Stockholm. It's kind of nuts. Like, uh, there was, I mean, there's obviously Spotify, but there's like the King one, which I think is the game one. Then there's uh, iZettle, I think, or something like that, which is a payment one. Like there's a lot of... Uh, good startup companies that come that's, out of that place. that's a good point it's a very um entrepreneurial place i think it's like it you, you see a lot of risks being taken i guess as you could say um yeah. the, the german for a, i was just gonna say prepare for a huge wave of ilp applicants after this podcast <laughs> i think there already is i don't think they need any help <laughs> more <laughs> um the german market's very similar of uh, the work-life balance i think this is the best uh, uh, country as far as the industry that I've seen so far. I haven't been everywhere, but I've I've definitely experienced uh, uh, an emphasis on work-life balance, not just at Trickster, but I've heard from other companies. And I think, you know, you think of of, uh, the German people as machines that never stop working, but actually their their whole um, ethos is like work hard. And then once, you know, six o'clock happens, it's Feierabend, which means like, a free, just go away like free time this is my time now and they put the pencils down and they walk off the work <laughs> but that's not just vfx that's like that's like very well known it's like once that um once that bell goes off in the factory like you're gone and you can't bother me and they like shut their cell phones off and stuff like that so it, it but you know what i think helps i think this is maybe the interesting about these mid-sized companies working on big productions because like in a bigger company it's easy to kind of hide a bit so Whereas you can't kind of like have people that need to be carried in these medium sized companies because it's just like cause there's less people. So you need some like heavy hitters who can actually knock stuff out. So I think that helps because you actually have people who kind of really are thinking things through and all this kind of because you have to because you've got a smaller team. You can't just throw more people at it because you have maybe down with the resources. But I think that's also a big part of why that. I mean, and this again goes for this. I mean, I feel like all our podcasts are basically just saying how good these medium sized companies are. But <laughs> there's definitely like as a senior comp, like that, I think there's a whole load of strengths to it, basically, as, as yeah. you kind of mentioned there. Um, well, Adrian, what about Spain? Do you guys have like a siesta from like 12 to 2 every day? <laughs> yeah, well, we're doing paella. And, and what you're <laughs> yeah. Every day, paella. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, not really. Uh, I think the. Big, bigger budget productions and, and uh, especially like the not, non-local productions that are starting to flow into the Spanish market have done a really good job of several things. One of them is making sure that every single studio has to work in a cer- certain way, uh, color-wise and formats and like all of those small studios that I don't know the Netflix stuff or you know the, these platforms are suddenly having to work in a more organized way and th- that's like the way to get it. And I felt that that has also enabled more studios to um, come forward that do not work in the guerrilla uh, crazy overtime way as well. Like Orca, I think is an example that we have not done any overtime in like one year, probably like 90% of, or 99% of the company. So even soups? Um, soups sometimes have to do it just because of the clients and or shoots or whatever, but uh, just as a team, um, I think that's something that's starting to be more the norm. And that takes me to the previous topic that we were talking about, which is the same thing that basically is the power of collective pressure. Uh, mm. Just thinking of one thing is the juniors that uh, Josh, you were mentioning, mentioning that now they are more, yeah, not happy with overtime or with conditions or with certain things. I think a big part of it is just the fact that they all learned in an industry moment where there was an overflow of work. So they maybe they got used or or they started thinking that that was the the, the industry itself. So mm-hmm. in that situation, you, you kind of adapt and and you become more yeah special about it and and that as a collective way of of thinking makes the the industry have to change. Like that reminds me of the pandemic. Like it was impossible to work remote. Well, now that's the only way. Okay, let's do it. So it it takes like a, a huge amount of people to be in a certain position at the same time so that you can make a change and what and also i think the there's a lot of power that's gone more to the artists because the amount of vfx companies now work on the high-end stuff right 
So there is a bit of competition. I mean, maybe not the, not the moment because it's a bit quiet, but in like April, May and things, like you do see the competition of companies competing. And part of that is marketing. Like you've got to market your company to make people want to work there. Because if you can't compete on show, because everyone's working on the same show and you can't necessarily compete on salary, then that's kind of all you've got, if that makes sense, like the culture of the company. Because um, that's the only differentiator you've got. Well, what do you guys think about uh, juniors and internships? Because uh, a lot of these mid-sized uh, companies, they can't really support um, the junior program or the internship program. Uh, Trix has had a few uh, over the years, but certainly not as much as the bigger studios and certainly not as much as, um, I don't even know if you would call it junior compositing at like a really small company. I'm talking 12, 15 people. That's almost like an apprenticeship in a lot of ways as, as when you when you go into like a 10 person company as a fresher out of uh, university. I would assume that's, you know, that they're going to try to keep you and, and train you up. But how how important is it? Like how how do people get into VFX if there's not these programs anymore? Because uh, I, I often don't know how to tell people advice. Um, when they're straight out of school. Straight in as junior compers nowadays, if I'm honest with you. Like, What's that? Some be straight in as junior compers nowadays. I know there's a lot yeah. of people in the industry who may be a bit pissed about that, but that's just how it is right now. There's a, a shortage of good compers. So rather than having to work your way through, I mean, when I started, it was like someone would start as a roto checker. They'd be a runner. Then they would check roto for a year. Then they got to finally do some roto. Then they finally got to do a prep, mm. new prep. And then they got to be a road of prep soup. And then you'd have to then take a lower salary to be a junior comp again. So it'd take you like four or five years. But nowadays, because a lot of that stuff's outsourced, most people are going straight into junior comper, which is good and, good and bad. It's a lot like sink and swim, if that makes sense. Like there's no slowly building up to you doing your comp shot. It's like, can you get shots out? Yes or no. If you can't, then we won't hold on to you. We might have different uh, definitions of this because... Oh. Um, oftentimes a junior comp is still someone with like two years experience, right? Like, I, I don't know that many people that are, okay, I have just graduated from university and now I have a job. Like, like I don't know many companies that are literally hiring first starting out people. Like usually you get a few credits and then you're, yeah, you're still a junior, but you know. But how you do they get in there? But that's the only way in. If there's that's no what I'm asking. Pro, if there's yeah. no road of prep roles, then all they can be is a junior. I mean, you can have a junior junior comp if you want, but a junior comp is basically... Someone who's fresh to comping and bias. Would, and that's would you now. say would you say that on every or on most productions that you worked on, there's a, at least a handful of them uh, on the show? Yeah, probably like two yeah. or three. Mm. I think the budget it, it, in COVID, the balance w went out of whack, and there were too many of the people with too little experience, and it got a bit nuts. But you're seeing that's why you saw a lot of people get laid off after the COVID boom because a lot of those were maybe people that wouldn't have been hired otherwise who maybe needed to kind of just improve slightly, if that makes sense. Um, and I've been hired a little too quick. Yeah. Well, what about in Spain or Japan? Because I, I feel like I want to see more juniors, but I just I haven't seen them lately. Um, you have some universities in Madrid, Barcelona, and, and different places, and like very good ones. And for example, like El Ranchito has, like El Ranchito Academy, they take like uh, graduates. Uh, oh, yeah? in, in Orca, now we have students from different universities, mostly from my program, as, as mm -hmm. I know how they work and stuff, but from, from like diff, uh, four different years, like, and they are joining every year. What we do is like, we, we take them as interns. Um, many times it's like eight of them per year. And then they just help um, and get help from previous students or juniors mm -hmm. or mids or seniors. And, and then they move into a junior position three months later or five or whatever. And then they work as junior for a few years. But I, I feel like they're a very important part of the of the team and, and not just because they are juniors but also because you need people that are more more fresh and and will be able to help others in a year and, and then you have that yeah people that are growing inside the company and get, getting more a uh, stable culture and, and not just relying on just take mercenaries that just come for a few months and and go and yeah. like it's different ways to go about it i think but yeah i see a lot yeah. of juniors in in general here in spain very similar to my experience as well. We'd, uh, I mean, it, it was, it's golden if you can find somebody straight out of school that like shows a lot of promise and talent and that, that's fresh. They have a fresh eye and you can, you know, kind of um, condition them a bit. Mm. Um, it's, it's sad when they leave because, you know, a lot of times when they're that good, they, 
they start knowing it and they they'll usually use like a smaller or a medium company as a springboard to get into a place like ILM or whatever. And here in Japan, I mean, the idea of working overseas is uh, it's very exotic. So a lot of people like would have dreams of going to somewhere in the West or, you know, just traveling in general. So um, there's quite a few uh, interns and juniors that we we had taken on and like they're off doing like really big things now. Where would they be high from? Was it from like universities? Are they good universities or just people yeah. online or? Some were uh, some some universities here in here in Japan. Some had gone over to Vancouver hmm. or like like Vancouver Film School, these kind of schools to one learn the craft, but also like learn English. And do, then, do you need yeah. to actually out of interest? Like, do you feel like being able to speak English? is is a massive advantage as a compositor even if you work in japan because obviously maybe all your notes from the clients are going to be in english but does it matter as a junior compo if you can speak english well do you think because obviously i mean you probably were given notes in english and if you're a director you a lot of directors western directors will give notes in english so how how important do you think it is um it really depends on the the goals of the artist and the company that they're at in the case in my case um i would say for a while, I learned just in my earlier stages of just like practicing Japanese, one of the first things I learned was like how to give feedback, how to say like left, right, too bright, too dark, et cetera, this and this. Um, but a lot of times, um, like I said, the, the, a lot of the artists have ambitions of eventually going overseas. So in that case, English is very, very important. Oh, yeah. Actually, f funny story in regards to language stuff in VFX. I was working on a show once, and there was uh, the director couldn't speak English, uh, and he was coming into our the director was coming to office with their translator, Swedish. And, no, no, not Swedish. And uh, so they were coming to the office with their tra this was a long time ago with their translator, and we were like, these notes are a bit weird that we're getting. Like they're a bit a bit kind of strange these notes, though, and they don't really kind of seem to be matching maybe the look that this person's going for. And then we had someone sit in that could speak the same language as the director. We found like someone's friend or so, and it ended up being that the fucking translator was like adding their own notes to the oh no. To the stuff. <laughs> so obviously the director didn't know because they can speak English. But the translator was like, yeah, and also we should like do this, do this, this. But like no one knew. We had no way of knowing. <laughs> that was a ghost director. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah ghost director. Like. A middleman. But yeah. Uh... <laughs> but yeah, it was just so funny. Like we were just discovered it. it was something I'd never thought about would be an issue before. Wow. Yeah, this translator was just adding their own notes past us. Have it. you seen have you seen any any cinema films lately? <laughs> cinema films. Sorry, uh, we What's call it a cinema film. We call it the cinema here. Sorry, we, we don't what say movie we... th Oh, okay, okay. okay. No, I meant like in that... theaters. In theaters. The cinema? That's, that's cinema. That's, that's, that's key. It is. It's the Kino. Oh, yeah. It's Kino one, of the, one of the only German words I know. I haven't been to cinema for a long time, actually. Do you enjoy going to cinema? I find, like, at the end of the day, I don't want to sit in a dark room looking at st edges and stuff like that on film. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if there's an interesting topic or not. I, just, I was just curious. Uh, I, I, no, I just find it funny that you called them movie films. Like, like uh, rather than. Just I guess films. cinema. Cinema. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Have you been to the cinema? I got you. I got you. I got you. <laughs> anyway, I've been to these movie films, lovely. <laughs> yeah, I've been hearing a lot about these movie films on the on the on, Tumblr, on the on projectors. The... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> ah, I'd love to go see a movie film with my dearest. <laughs> <laughs> it's in color now. <laughs> Josh, that accent is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'm so sorry. I'll ask the question uh, again. So, um, it. Do you guys think that uh, cinema going or uh, going into the movie theater to watch movies, is that uh, dying out? Is everyone watching it now at homes? Like, how often do you go? What, do you think it's on a downhill trajectory? I mean, I remember going to see it, went to see Avatar, maybe like a few weeks after it was out. And this is in Brixton, so this isn't like in a big IMAX. And there were six other people in the cinema with me. And that'd been the, really? that was the first time I'd been to the cinema in a long, long time. Because I don't really go that much. And yeah, I was like, wow, this is cinemas are different from what I remember as a kid. Um, yeah, I don't know. How about you, uh, Agent? What do you think? Um, I've never gone too much to the cinema. But at least here, it might be a micro thing. But it's 
packed when I go. Like really, I went to. I mean, probably was IMAX, Oppenheimer, and stuff. And it, but it was like almost one month after it was released, and it was full, like completely full. And um, how know. much does it cost to go to the cinema there? I live in London, so it's probably like. 20 30 pounds or something so oh mm, that's wow. maybe a reason <laughs> no it's uh yeah probably <laughs> 10 to 13 euro and it's way more expensive than it was like it's the same ago. in germany 12 euro 14 something like that about 20 20 bucks here yeah 20 bucks yeah. do you go often g or no no nah, i got a projector so that's my cinema so you wait for films to get released and then you rent it or so and then you play it they're generally on like Netflix, right? Streaming or something. Well, once in a while, I'll rent a film, usually on Prime, because for some reason they have like films faster. Yeah, I'm wondering, like, isn't it in a lot of ways uh, kind of a cultural phenomenon when you, when a big film comes out and you don't want to get to be spoiled or or um, you know you want to be in the in the coffee break room like talking about the latest uh, the latest Chris Nolan movie that came out or something. Um, I think part of me is like I, I want to. I don't want to spoil it. I want to see it, and also I want to see it in like the best, some films, the like the best possible, yeah, sound and, and screen. That's a big part for sure. I mean, I think it kind of comes down to uh, what we were saying about VFX and knowing how to use VFX. Just for myself, in terms of like going to the cinema, I feel like the only times I've when I've been going to cinema, it's not just to watch like any film. It's like wow, I think this is going to look amazing on a big screen, right? It's yep. like you kind of want that part again you could feel like it's going to add something actually one th film i do remember being amazing at cinema was the hateful eight which was that um quentin tarantino film because it was like going to the theater like me and a few mates went because there was like an interlude and it was like wow this feels like a night out if that makes sense because you go to some cinemas like it's just floor sticky and it's just crap and like all well, this kind of it was actually it was like wow this is a experience i don't mind paying this kind of price so um yeah i think that's probably a big part of it like more real in some way. Uh, that's like some films. I'm just thinking. For me, a, a really big reason has always been like the visuals. Uh, if you want to see like Avatar, I would not watch it at home. Uh, Oppenheimer, I, I really wanted. It, that's probably why it has all of that investment in uh, IMAX film and like all of that part that's so expensive and so tedious to to work in that way. But it in some way makes people want to see it in the in the theater in some way it is mm. nice to be a part of that collective experience as well where you're all seeing this thing for the first time everybody's reacting laughing when the laughing part comes on or their jump when the the scary part comes on it's nice to be a part of that at times i think it's nice to get away from all the distractions because i i have a habit i just turn my phone completely off uh during any movie that i'm seeing uh at the as cinema you should uh, well <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's a kind of extreme because you could just mute it or so, but I just turn it off completely, uh, just just to make sure. But but I like I like that. Uh, you know, I just went a few days ago to see the Godzilla film, um, and just because I heard the VFX were really good, and I just want to see the experience. And the only thing that you're seeing is 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 the screen, right? So like in a living room, maybe like yeah, you're kind of not seeing your peripheral, but literally it's just black, and then a, a couple of people's heads, and then this gigantic screen. So you're fully immersed, as immersed you, as you could possibly be, basically, unless you had a VR headset on your face. So, um, yeah, I quite like that. I quite like being not distracted by anything. Do you think that in some years that uh, the collective movie experience will be people watching it through virtual reality? I wouldn't say virtual reality, but I, I think even today, home cinemas have gotten so good that a lot of people agree with you guys of just like i'll just wait another month until it comes out on netflix and just watch it at home but then i kind of thought that if everyone's well not everyone but if a lot of people are working from home maybe you would want to go out like have a reason to go out if that makes sense like i kind of thought it'd be the opposite but um... unless you become glued to your chair at that point from being yeah. inside all the time <laughs> I've got so much weight that my body's just stuck to the arms. I like, can't physically. <laughs> yeah, that's also the the pendulum thing that you were mentioning. Do that. Yeah, yeah. But w one of my favorite parts of going to the cinema in a group of people is afterwards, like getting a beer or just going down to to a restaurant or something and chatting about what we just saw. Like, I love that. I think that's the most fun. Like, a deconstructing 
what you just witnessed, the cool parts, remembering certain bits, uh, like like talking about the metaphors of the film or anything. I really love all that stuff. And like, yeah, you could do that the next day that you saw a film, but um, but also you would have to ask first, did you see that film? You know, it's when you go as a group, it's it's uh, it's like an experience together, right? It's it's a unique thing. I do wonder what's going to happen with this because I remember in uh, COVID, I thought that like a Netflix would buy up all these cinemas that were going out of business super cheap and then they just only show their own stuff, if that makes sense. Because what a way to have a monopoly, right? If you own the distribute the cinemas, then that's uh, that would be kind of nuts and that could be part of your subscription. Um, I mean, I know why they probably wouldn't do that because it costs a lot of money, but that's kind of could be a cool way for them to do it. And I wonder if that, if like it was part of your subscription, would you people? More people go to cinema because then you know if it's a cost thing or if it's a pain in the ass to get that thing right. Um, I'm surprised no one's done it. Yeah, yet. Jeff Bezos needs to stop spending his money on boats and stuff. That like would that. be interesting, especially if Netflix did it and they called their cinema the Red Box. Ooh, that sounds a bit uh, Amsterdam dodginess, though. <laughs> <laughs> the Red Room. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think I th <laughs> Netflix. Uh, I think Netflix's stated goal is to basically have everybody watching it from the home. And they, they have no interest in how, like they consider cinemas, I think, their competition, actually, in many ways. Uh, they would prefer that cinemas went out of business and then they all, everyone just bought a subscription because that's the only thing that you could do. Uh, I, I don't think they're in the, in the distribution system because it's undermining the, like, why, why would I? subscribe to netflix if now they're just showing other stuff and yeah but the thing is though netflix has got all the data on where people are viewing the most type of this film and what location so they'd be able to buy like they'd only have to buy a few and they would know kind of like the target market and where they are like they're not going to be guessing when they do that so i don't know, it could just be interesting i think if they got a couple because they were dirt cheap mm. right in covid like they're all going out of business so um yeah i don't know be interesting uh, to see i still i think films make a lot of money on the cinema I think they like, like there was a big uh, shift that happened with the death of the DVD and uh, death of the the Blu-ray. I think if there was the death of the cinema, I think you would be seeing a lot lower budgets than what we're seeing now. I think for sure. Um, yeah, it's just a different experience in some way. Even if you are just watching something that looks great, uh, just the the fact that it's real and you are there, the the more everything becomes digital, the more that will get value. Even if it's not for the masses or for every single film, but still, like, even with films doing in, done in film, like they are still being done in film, and it doesn't make any sense from the technical. I mean, I, I don't want to go into that topic. Um, yeah. It it does make sense in some way, but it's still alive, and all, all like films made with AI, whatever comes next, uh, whatever that substitutes, it cannot be in a hundred percent because the value that people perceive is in the in the real and that's probably also part of the no mm. cgi just trying to look this is real in some way um it, it you know like never fully disappears just because there's so many people interested in different things so how, how, about, how about cinemas in japan though g like are they pretty booked up or are they pretty empty like how are they over there how are the movie theaters yeah they're pretty i would say the last what's the last film i saw i think guardians of the galaxy the mm. first pretty, one well, that's, uh, one. Okay. That's, like, that's a long time ago, Jeep. Way back. <laughs> we get movies super late here in Japan. <laughs> a guy with a USB stick has to cycle there. And then... Uh... <laughs> oh, it's a floppy drive. Yeah. <laughs> and was it pretty um, busy? It was pretty packed, yeah. I mean, COVID was, was uh, crazy, though. We had, like, the social distancing thing. Social mm. distancing. Every other seat. But... Mm. Um, it took a while, but I think now, like, they're constantly packed still. I mean, that's the cool thing, I guess. Like, if you get more lower-budget films, then there's a quicker turnaround at the cinemas, which means maybe you'd get more people and stuff like that. So, going back full circle to, like, what we are talking about before, it's, it could there's, be do them some good. I think, as well, though, it, I, I, do, I don't want to underestimate the effect that this the streaming has had in relation to the movie theaters because we are seeing a lot of films that were meant to originally come out in movie theaters go straight to netflix or prime or whatever and yeah. it's like back then we had the like direct to dvd or direct to vhs thing mm. but it's it's not the equivalent now because we're seeing movies that like had proper budgets go straight to netflix 
or one of the other streamers. I think uh, the the strikes brought up an interesting uh, point where they they were trying to talk about revenues of like w what residuals they get. Um, and the the point was kind of being thrown around that in order to like to go to a movie theater and to buy a ticket for Oppenheimer, you need to like take your human body, drive it somewhere, go to the cinema, buy a physical ticket, go in there sit down and then watch it and then leave right so it's like the purchase is like i want to see oppenheimer <laughs> and you go in and you get it whereas on netflix you could just be like i'm bored sunday afternoon oh that's a cool film and you just chuck it on with no expense or you didn't really you bought the subscription but you didn't actually buy the film or like you haven't actually put your b besides clicking on it to see what it was and then maybe you turn it off 20 minutes later you know so i don't know how, how the views counts and everything so i mean that's a super interesting point right because i know like a lot of films get a ton of money from just james bond where's no meager watch and now they've spent a load of money whereas in a cinema it's like yeah everyone's gonna be looking at that fucking watch and knowing that he wears it whereas it's quite right if you're looking at that thing on netflix those views aren't the same in terms of advertising costs and all sorts of stuff so should they be priced accordingly it's uh I mean, it's not, it's nobody's walk different. nobody's walking out of the cinema like you don't see people like give up halfway through them <laughs> and like walk out oh i got laundry to do and then, you know so like they're committed they're in there but i don't know the same as netflix like how many seasons of a of a tv show have you started and then two episodes later you're like yeah yeah i'm gonna give up on that yeah yeah lower costs of entry basically i guess another thing as well that it was kind of interesting in regards to the strikes is the whole kind of like um i know people got up and arm well not i just saw a few people kind of talking about it it's like the whole they were offering extras to get paid 200 dollars. i think it is for like a whole digital body scan and that's mm. i mean and that is kind of nuts like that's a quite obviously it depends if you need the money but like that's quite not a whole lot of money for that but at the same time it's kind of we can just invent people in vfx right like you can just blend shape between four or five different people so it's like that that's such a weird point to get stuck on because it's one of those things that if they refuse it then there's all sorts of workarounds for that um and that kind of actually goes to another thing which is mm. with the strike uh production houses now know how much that strike cost them so now they know how long they've got to make those people that had a big impact on the strike irrelevant, right? Because we know that that contract's out in like three or four years. So will there be more of a push to make those people irrelevant next time they try and do this strike? Like, like to about. try to replace it quicker or try to make it obsolete you faster. Know that, well, you know, right, like how long that, when that contract ends now, you've got an end, you know when it's going to end and when the renegotiations, renegotiations going to happen. And you know how much it costs you right so now you know how much you've got to throw at trying to tackle that problem to a certain extent so it'd be interesting to see if studios push to that yeah from what from what i've heard you know that the the contracts renew every three or three or four years i think it's three years and uh the last major writer strike for example was 10 uh 10 or 12 years ago and that's so four contract renewals have happened and it's not like an existential threat every single time, but it's when these like giant hurdles come up where a breaking point has been reached and then they go on strike. I would assume that the next asking point from the writers or actors wouldn't be so substantial and probably would be worked out in the negotiation room. I'm just assuming just based off of historically, there's not like a strike every three years. There's like every decade or so there's something. That's true. That's true. Was the last one, the big one, was it when you guys were in LA? Were you in LA the last time? Yeah, the writer's strike. But I was in university. It's 2008 or 2007 or 8, something like that. Yeah, that was that was during Heroes. I don't know if you guys ever watched that show, Heroes. There was one amazing, amazing first season, and then there was a writer's strike, and then, and then the second season was not so good. And that pretty much killed the show, I think. But that was a that was one of the first big like VFX heavy um, TV shows that I remember, like being just a regular show on TV. Yeah, it's it's just like to think about. Like it's just like wow, like they know how much this thing cost them. So and yeah, and with the with the whole kind of like paying two hundred dollars for an extra, maybe they use MetaHuman right and stuff like this to sign people or other stuff. Have you? Have, I, have, I saw, have, I saw this amazing. Um, there, there was a, a video conference or a presentation by Rob uh, Niederhurst, and he's like a really famous uh, VFX supervisor. Like he's done tons of films, worked for like I don't know thirty years or something. And uh, 
yeah, he he gave like a presentation to the actors to SAG. And there were, I forget how many people were joined in on this live stream, but it was like three, four hundred people. And they were all listening to him basically break down the difference between um, AI, VFX, CGI, digi doubles, uh, AI, generative AI versus machine learning. Like he did like a whole comprehensive like one hour talk where he broke it down um, for people who basically don't know anything. And he broke it down in very um, digestible, digestible ways and then opened it up for like two hours of questions from people. And I did, I did listen through it um, just to see like, you know, what was being presented and if it was like something that was accurate and it was very well presented, but like he wasn't trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. He was just telling it how it is and how long things would take. And uh, yeah, I mean, this, it, that's a, that's a thing is like just people just don't know how these, these things are forming or they don't know the difference between this and that. And, I mean, Adrian, with your LED, obviously you're doing a lot of LED panel stuff. Do you find that you're having to educate clients and directors a lot and on that stuff or not so much? Do people kind of know about it more now? Um, probably in other countries it's different. Uh, I mean, here, what I'm seeing is that the DOPs and directors that work with this, like one year later, they are loving it and they're working with it more and more. But that's like just a niche and people in general do not know it. And there's still a lot of, yeah. Um education to do but if I you've got new client like are they kind of are their expectations too small for what it can do or too big for what it can do you get both uh the the more uncommon is the the one that asks the questions and wants to know what the limitations are 90 percent of the clients are like either believing that this doesn't work for anything or that this is like the fantasy and it's just will solve you, all your problems do you have a little intro pamphlet video like like from Jurassic Park where they had like the warm show and like this is yep. a dinosaur? <laughs> yes, we, we have a, like all of that, like documents uh, t talking about what, what the system is. And when, we always uh, bring people in in the States and we just play like a kind of a PowerPoint on steroids. Like this is a <laughs> thousand net screen and that's a 2000 and th that one has this color accuracy and you're meant to shoot <laughs> against this one. And and please do not focus on that. Uh, yeah, it's that's like cool. half an hour presentation, but still. Uh, you really need people to come in and test it and play with it and do some actual shoot, even if it's before the 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 real thing. And that already gives like like you you need to test it. Uh, and people that do not test it, even if they've been DOPs for thirty years and they think they they know it all, like this is a new set of variables. Even if it's just light in the end, but it's new variables and you need to play with it. One of the one of the things that the actors were asking and during this uh, presentation, like the most common thing was, how long does that take and how much does that cost? So and and that that really helps people understand like the AI AI stuff. Like what can it do? How much like how much would that take for a team of people to do it versus an AI? And and how good would it be comparatively? Uh, and yeah, it was it's interesting that they're, they're thinking of things in time in terms of time and money, and like, is that a viable thing that they're gonna do? Yeah, but another thing that a studio cares. But I remember working on this advert, and they spent a ton of money on this advert, and then the actor said something controversial on Twitter, and everything was wiped off. So that's another advantage, right, for digital people. They don't say anything controversial and they don't take sides on weird political issues and stuff like this, right? So <laughs> that's another big thing. And that's also a reason why you don't want someone to be too attached to a superhero, right? Because otherwise, if the actor says something, you don't want Spider-Man to now be tarred with that same brush, right? So like, uh, I don't know, that's another reason why you might see a push to replace people potentially. Speaking on that point, I was watching some uh, some videos. It was kind of like the death of the death of cinemas and films. It was kind of this long video deconstructing it, and and one of them was about um, how there are no movie stars anymore. Like the only movie stars that we have are like really old, like uh, like Jack and the Casino, Tom Cruise, or 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 so, or Robert De Niro, and uh, th there's not so many new ones. Like maybe there's occasionally somebody like Chris Pratt or something that has some some eyeballs, but it's even then it's not the same. And what you said, Josh, was spot on, which was that people care about the character that they're playing, not necessarily the actor that's playing that character. So people want to go see Captain America, but maybe not Chris Evans' Captain America. It could be another Captain America. And they love Captain America. They don't necessarily love Chris Evans. So that when Chris Evans goes and makes another film, like it doesn't have as many eyeballs as Captain America did because they care more about that character. 
but it makes sense right in terms of production studio because then if if the actor or actress gets power then they can make uh demands and stuff like that so it's kind of like a weird with just position i guess that's super interesting it's going to be so interesting honestly and also it's like now you get to just kind of if an actor dies or actress dies then you get to just keep using their likeness potentially going forward with the digital <laughs> double and all that kind of stuff and that's where it all gets weird right because so it's like yeah i don't know it's very interesting times i think we all know this all, all four of us know that like things are slowly starting to change and it's looking like we're on the edge of something right for the last eight or nine or ten years that i've been in the industry or we've all been in the industry g for 50 years i think g you mentioned right you've been in the industry now Did but, you uh, 50? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but nothing, everything has been kind of like not stagnant but like fairly similar and there's been a feudal change but now it's like with, with everything going on it's like you can see something's yeah. gonna go at some point we just don't know when and what yeah it's exciting and terrifying at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, definitely on exactly. definitely on the edge of something. Yeah, something's gonna gonna change soon. All right. Well, let's wrap it up. And uh, thanks for joining. And we'll see you on the next one. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.